Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Nerd of the Third Power, your one-stop shop for all things nerdy and awesome. I'm your host and master of ceremonies, Dr. Gonzo. With me, as always, in this epic quest of awesomeness is our resident anime goddess, the cat. Cat, how are you doing this week? I am doing okay. N- nothing special, just just okay. All right, okay. Well, I mean, that's better than many can say. Mike, how, what, how are you doing this week? Uh, I am doing pretty awesome, as when you should be hearing this, uh, it's my birthday tomorrow. So, yay, I turned 39. I am older than shit. That's okay. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just another uh, another 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 week of business here as uh, we continue in our Halloween spooky month. So uh, tonight we are discussing Unsolved Mysteries, uh, a TV show that uh, all, I'm sure every one of us has watched at some point. It's, it was a, you know, a pretty much st- a standard one of those things that they issued you uh, when you moved into an American suburban neighborhood. Here's your welcome basket, your fruit, your, your meats and cheeses and your schedule for when Unsolved Mysteries comes on. So, yes, that's going to be a load of fun. Uh, but of course, there is procedure to follow. So we're going to begin, as always, with Ask a Geek. And uh, first question here. Let's see. This one uh, comes from Mary. And her question is, why does it take so long for Fools Who Ride to come out? Because I suck. <laughs> that's the that's the answer. I just, I just, COVID, COVID has completely thrown my routine off. So it's like, it's one of those things where it's, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep my head together. So unfortunately, editing shows has, uh, has, has pretty much, has fallen into disarray. So, uh, but uh, I am gonna. We we're, we are gonna be more. We're, there is gonna be more of that coming out. And uh, actually, as we record this, uh, we will have just recorded uh, season two of Fools Who Ride. So uh, there, there's a lot more of that coming down the pipe. Let's see here now. Next question here. Uh, this one comes from Robert and uh, Mike. This is one for y- that uh, I think you will really like. And uh, his question is, uh, what I- what is your favorite horror trope? Mike, what's your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite scare? What's a, a what's your particular favorite uh, horror moment that really gets you going? So what's what's your favorite horror scare? I guess. Mm, scare. I'm trying to think. Um, I'm not a big fan of jump scares. I'm a big fan of big special effects that are practical. I'd say my favorite. Ver- uh, I think a thing that really illustrates this well is John Carpenter's The Thing and how how well those practical effects hold up even today like that's a wonderful application of makeup miniature stop motion and the practical physical effects themselves do not like cg heavy stuff i mean there was some great makeup in the walking dead for example but when they do some of the headshots and it's very obviously cg blood it looks really 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 dumb um but i'm always a big sucker for a good creature effect favorite makeup effect of all time is from friday the 13th part 7 the look of kane hodder as jason i just think that's a wonderful makeup effect it's held up so well that's my jason is part 7 so those would be my things okay and uh, let's open this up to the rest of us so cat what is uh, what's your favorite horror scare I guess or least, my... or least favorite as the case may be. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't like jump scares either. Um, what I like are like really quiet shots where um, whoever the character is is walking around, whether they are looking for something or they are just walking around doing their normal thing, and we, the audience, are the only ones who get to see the spooky thing. Um, I thought this was particularly well done in The Haunting of Hill House. Uh and and it's it's uh it's sequel series the haunting of bly manor um where the characters are just walking around doing things and they just like don't catch the ghost or the spook or whatever and we get to catch it and and it's when you start screaming ah run run it's right there it's right there and you're just like yelling at the tv because something really scary has just showed up on screen um it, it just makes you feel um i guess uh like so i i want to say sort of helpless it makes you feel like oh you know something that the that the character doesn't and you just want them to listen to you but you can't they can't hear you no matter how much you yell and throw your remote um and i just think that that's such like a a futile feeling that's part of the the horror like the the fear of it is like just this helplessness that you feel for for this character you just want to help them and you can't and i i think that that is probably my favorite horror trope okay uh i would i would say the one that always gets to me um is 
Uh, I call it the I call it the slow burn, the 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 incoming slow burn, and it's where the character knows that they are about to die or that they are about to be mutilated in some way, but it happens very slowly. Uh, perfect example of this is uh, from Zombie Two. Uh, you probably already know the scene that I'm talking about. Uh, oh, the eyeball scene, right? The, the eyeball on the splinter scene, yeah, where the the zombie reaches in, grabs the woman by her hair, and very slowly pulls her eyeball first onto this giant splinter and you know it's coming but it's just it happens so slowly and the camera doesn't cut away at any point and it's just stuff like that just sends me just careening over the back of the couch to hide because i don't want to see that shit it just scares the hell out of me and it's like because stuff like because like mike you mentioned john carpenter's the things like the scene where the guy's doing the 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 defibrillator thing and as he's putting his hands down the stomach opens up and bites his hands off something like that that happens really quick like i that you know it, it startles me and it scares me and it's horrifying but you know it's over quick and you know at that point we've moved on to to something else but like those slow burn moments just ugh, they give me the ghiblies mm. so yeah hey, those are so so now that you've described your favorite horror trope i now have a new least favorite horror trope <laughs> <laughs> happy to be a servant that is so awful what you just described. I hate that so much. <laughs> the, 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 the incoming slow burn death. Okay, all right. <laughs> God, that's so awful. Everything that you just described, I can picture with perfect clarity in my head, having never seen that film, and that is the worst thing. That is just oh, terrible. Yeah. That scene is so much more brutal than you can imagine because this that movie came out in the early 1980s. So they when weren't afraid no one to gave a shit. <laughs> yeah, and it's Italian horse. So they gave even less of a shit than American people. It's brutal. It's, wow. No, no, no fucks were given. They were owed fucks. That's how deficit they were in fucks to give. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's see here now. Uh, okay. Uh, here's a question here. Another Halloween question one. And uh, this one comes from Richard, and he asked, "Haunted houses, yay or nay?" So, Cat, uh, let's open this up to you first. Uh, what do you have? You been to any haunted houses that you particularly enjoyed? Um, I did. Oh God, this was a long time ago now. But the last haunted house I went to, because I don't really care for haunted houses that much, um, the last haunted house I went to was actually at like Universal Studios during their like Halloween thing, Halloween Horror Nights, or whatever they call it. And mm -hmm. um, I went to two haunted houses that night, and one of them was Silent Hill themed. I, having Ooh. never played the games at all with my vaguest knowledge based on cosplay, went through that and was like, oh, that's Pyramid Head. And people were like freaking out. I'm like, it's Pyramid Head. I felt like, like I was watching a cosplayer. It was so ruined for me. <laughs> uh, but I don't, I don't really care for um, haunted houses. I, I find that it's not my, it's not really my bag. I, I get sort of like, it's like a sensory overload for me, where everything just gets too loud. Um, it's too loud, people are jumping out at you with loud things, and I don't like that at all. I don't like loud things. Um, and and it's, a lot of it involves walking. I don't want to walk. My lazy ass wants to Use sit your legs, man! <laughs> Says the cripple. <laughs> uh, you know, like you could do like haunted hay rides, which I've done before when I was little, and like I just don't enjoy people coming at me with stuff. Um, there is a strong like flight or fight thing that goes on, and like I just want to like it's it's not scary to me. It's just intrusive. I think is is what I would think it is. Um, she's, she's not kidding about that fight or flight thing. I once put my hand on her to get her attention. She fucking suplexed me. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. If somebody tries to touch me, I punch them. That's just the, the default reaction. Um, I do remember um, my brother and I were just talking about this like a couple weeks ago. But um, when we were really little, we were still living in Puerto Rico at the time. They put on a haunted house for all the kids on base. And I bit someone. There was like a wall that was hands coming out to grab you, and I fucking bit my own dad. <laughs> Cause he was taking part in it. And and like I just let somebody grabbed me, I fucking bit them, and it turned out to be my dad. So that is my <laughs> level of enjoyment of, <laughs> of haunted houses. Okay. Mike, what about you? Haunted houses, yay or nay? 
I love a, a, a good haunted house. I've been to two really good ones. There was one in Niagara Falls, New York, or no, sorry, Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada. I think it was called Nightmares. And they did something really interesting with uh, perspective. And what they did, there's a section you get to in the haunted house and you hit a wall. And then they start closing the walls in on you. And like with you and your group, eventually you are literally backed into each other's backs and you get claustrophobic real fucking fast. Um, and I always thought that was incredibly clever. And I always wanted to go back either with one of my force uh, FX lightsabers to light it up or with a pair of my night vision goggles. Um, so I always thought that place was really, really well done. Uh, there's another place, and this is more for the little kind of kid in me, because I really enjoyed this. But there was a really cool haunted hayride that I went on when I was in college. And somebody came out of the woods dressed as this cross between Jason and Leatherface with like a, a chainsaw. And it had the belt was off of the chainsaw, so he couldn't actually hurt himself. But he ran it against the back of the hay wagon and sparks started shooting up and i'm thinking oh that's good um and there were like there were there were, there were like these teenage girls in the group i was with and they're like ah! and i'm just thinking, yes scream it was so much fun so a good haunted house can be really really effective i know there are certain haunted houses where you have to sign a waiver um i would love to do one of those because i love being scared because it's not something that happens often to me, so I love to savor the moment when I can, if that makes well, any sort of sense. Well, then, if you ever find yourself uh, down my way uh, as, as we come close to Halloween, I'll have to take you up to Philadelphia to the Eastern State Penitentiary for their haunted prison tour, which segues into my story. Uh, I have actually been to two haunted uh, two haunted attractions in the last couple of years. Uh, I did Field of Screams, which is a haunted house slash hayride thing, um, and I didn't enjoy it all that much because they tell you up front that no one's going to touch you. And I'm just like, well, you've just removed all the menace for me. You know, they're, 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 why should I be scared? There's there's nothing for me to be terrified of if no, if you know, if there's no danger. Uh, but with the Eastern State Penitentiary Haunted Prison Tour, if you sign that waiver, they'll give you a little wristband uh, that actually gives, uh, it shows that you've consented to uh, be messed with. And I, uh, I signed up for that. And I didn't get messed up. I didn't, you know, nobody really came at me. Uh, but I think that's because of what happened to me uh, as, as we went through this tour. Um, so it's, 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 it's the, the haunted prison tour is set up in sections. So you basically, as you move through the different prison blocks and as uh, me and my date uh, for this, we were going through, we were going, we were moving from one section to the next and we're getting in the line for the next section of the tour. Uh, we're moving through the, the, the line and the separators. And I don't know if I just like, if someone pushed me or if I stepped on a divot in the pavement or something, but I just fell over and just went down like a sack of potatoes. I knocked over uh, one of the metal uh, lane dividers. Uh, you know, staff comes over and they help me up and, you know, up, up to my feet. And uh, the only thing I remember, the thing I remember clearest about this happening is this kid about 10 feet behind me in the line turned to his mother and going, oh my God, that lady fell. Which my <laughs> date was like, there was blood in her mouth from trying not to laugh. <laughs> um and turns out i'd actually sprained my ankle in the fall so I, you know but of course when you do that you don't realize it's happened until after you've put it through some activity so we're basically you know power walking through this haunted attraction so by the time we're done with it i am practically crawling to my car oh my because God. my ankle has just swollen to the size of fucking grapefruit and i'm just like i told i told my test like look, look Latoya, we, we, we can't come, we can't go home yet i gotta call my sister who is a, a she's a, she's a doctor of sports medicine i was like i gotta call my sister and have her look at this ankle because like i think amputation is necessary <laughs> but for like the rest of the night if i wanted to just send her into fits of giggles i would just i'd just say oh my gosh, that lady fell and then she would just giggle for you know five straight minutes then go i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm so sorry but it was <laughs> It was, it, it, you know, it was, it was a really well, well done experience. I thought, you know, especially when you consider that the Eastern State Penitentiary is itself supposed to be haunted. You know, I thought it was a really neat little tour. Um, but like I said, I was, I was disappointed that nobody, uh, nobody tried to mess with me. But I guess they saw that I was, you know, walking wounded and decided to leave me alone. That I, that I'd suffered enough. So yeah. All right. Uh, next question here. Let's see. This one comes from Danny, and uh, it's open to all of us. And it's if you could design 
a Halloween costume for one of your castmates, what would it be? And I am going to pick Mike for my pick because I've got the perfect one that will uh, go for you, that will go for your uh, your your thing that you could do uh, with your your roller buggy. And that's okay. we 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 dress you up like uh, you know in in leather and chains and spikes, and then we put a pole on the front of your scooter. And we crucify a dummy to that scooter and dress it up, uh, you know, again, and the same thing in the the, the leather and the spikes and the we, we give it a muzzle and uh, you become one of the barbarians from Mad Max Fury Road. And we hook up, okay. we hook up a, sp a speaker to the dummy that you press a button and it shouts, witness me! <laughs> I will be Lord Humongous. Yes! Um, interesting. Okay. You know what would be really cool to add on to the Mad Max is if you have like a glitter cannon... And then you're just like, shiny and chrome. You just yeah. throw that shit in people's faces. Anybody pisses you off, just glitter in their face. So, yes. Uh, okay, so uh, Kat, who would you pick and, and what costume would you design for them? Oh my god, I don't know. Uh, I have a hard enough time figuring out my own costumes. Like, I excruciate over these things. Um, <sighs> I think... I think I'd want to dress you up, Gonzo, but I want to dress you up as your character in Fools Who Ride. Okay, all right. So you want to dress me up as uh, as Marcus Hawk, the uh, disgraced Alendian knight? Okay, all right. Yes, mostly so that we can get a full appreciation for multiple characters wearing heavy armor and trying to do anything. And trying to do anything stealthy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, we're fucking awful because we're both in heavy armor, but I think it would really fun i think um i think you would probably enjoy walking around like a knight as long as we're not doing it in the middle of the goddamn summer because that no. shit gets hot well if this is a halloween costume we'd be doing it obviously for halloween so okay so sending you out there in heavy armor probably i i, I believe a cape and uh, letting you go to town with trying to i like you would definitely ham it up and be like good sir my lady <laughs> Even though Marcus talks like that, not at all. <laughs> okay. I know, but for, for Halloween, you totally pull out all the stops. Yep, yep. You got it, it, Halloween. You got to go big or go home. Okay, Mike. Uh, what about you? If you were to design a Halloween costume for one of us, what would it be? Um, this would be more so just because I think it would be an interesting visual, um, aesthetic. I would dress up cat, and this is probably just because I just watched this movie recently. I would love to see you as a character from the Aliens universe. And mm -hmm. I, I I don't know why. I was thinking, I was watching a scene in the one movie, Aliens, and there's the corpsman. And a corpsman is the medical officer. And she's named Dietrich. And there's just something, when you were talking about this, I just pictured Kat in the armor with the helmet holding the flamethrower. And I think you would just look incredibly confident and badass in that armor set. And that like, I think it would, it, it would just look literally fucking cool. Like, hi, I'm a colonial Marine. I'm here to kick ass and chew bubble gum, sir. Um, yeah. So I was just thinking about that. So yeah, if I had, if budget and I could get screen accurate stuff, mm -hmm. that'd be my pick hands down. Oh God. Okay. So what would you want your own dream costume to be? Oh man, dream costume. I would love to be, this is going to be a little bit out there, but if budget was no concern, a flood infected ODST trooper from Halo. I want Ooh. spores busting out of my helmet. I want uh. goo dripping off my face. I want to be holding like one of those um, SMGs, but I want like tendrils just coiled around it like i want to look gross as shit and okay. i want to be gooey i think it would look awesome i got a i got a, i got a couple a couple for cats that have been mulling on over the last couple minutes uh one of them is elvira but it will be the coldest day in hell before she does that i think true facts <laughs> the other is uh i think that uh the cat would look really badass as maleficent oh, i can God. see that which one though? Because I wouldn't want to do the movie version. I don't want to do any version. Oh god, there's so much headwear involved. <laughs> oh man. But what would your dream costume be, Gonzo? My dream costume? Oh god. If money, if if again, if money and budget were no option, 
Uh, I would actually like to uh, have a suit of Space Marine power armor. Uh, Blood Angels chapter, gotta represent. Uh, but uh, yeah, that would be that would be that would be my uh, my dream costume: a, a Blood Angels Space Marine from Warhammer Forty Thousand. Oh man, my dream costume really has not changed over like the last fifteen years. I have always and will always, if budget were no option, want to be Xena, Warrior Princess. Pretty cool. I can see that. I just there's a lot of like leather work and metal work in there that um, I had a guy lined up to do it for me, and then it just never panned out. But um, there's, it's not even like you can go buy that costume, but I want it to look good, and none of the costumes available look good. So I'd have to commission it from somebody, and that can get pretty pricey with leather and metal. But that's that's my dream costume. I just want to be Xena. I'd even get a fucking wig. I hate wigs, you guys. If you've never had to wear a wig, it's so itchy. But I just to get the bangs, I I I do this because she's so cool. Like Xena's always been one of my heroes, and I'm just like, man, I'd love to literally be Xena. But if I can't literally be Xena, dressing up as Xena for Halloween would be kick ass. Tell you what, if you if you wore that costume to work, nobody would fuck with you. That's true. I literally can't because of safety. I work in a warehouse. This is my struggle, guys. My my several year struggle since I started working at my current job. I work in a warehouse and I have to wear jeans and steel-toed boots. Otherwise, I can't go places in my work. And if I know I'm going to have a chill day and I don't really need to leave my office too much, I can get away with other things. But like every time I want to do something, I'm like, okay, what what costume can I wear that I can wear to work? that involves pants. Everything has to be pants and boots. Something that'll look good with my steel-toed boots. It's such a drag. <laughs> all right. And uh, that's all the Ask the Geek questions that we have for this week. Thank you as always for sending them in. As always, you can send them to us through the email at drgonzo at nerd of the third Love getting your questions, love bringing them on the air. And so get your questions in and you just might get yours read on the show. All right, and with that, we're going to jump right into the meat and potatoes of this episode. And uh, and I think all of us at some point in our lives uh, have have seen the television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack, uh, who we have said many times on the show recently, uh, has a voice that's just audible chocolate that will just wrap you up in a blanket and just make you feel like everything's going to be all right as it terrifies you as he talks about all this unsolved shit that's gone down. And... Uh, Kat brought the actually uh, brought this topic forward to discuss. Uh, so, uh, Kat, let's just open the floor to you. You go ahead and get us started. What the, what drew you to this discussion topic? Yeah, I feel like it's actually come up in a couple of previous episodes. I have no idea what order we're airing anything in. So, I'm hoping everybody has gotten to hear us randomly off to mention unsolved mysteries. But I feel like um, due to when it aired and our age. Um, for the three of us, because we're all very close in age, that it was very informative to our personalities. Um, and like our entire, like our whole generation, we were raised on, at some point in our youth, our youth, we watched Unsolved Mysteries. Whether it was reruns or watching it live whenever it aired, we all watched this shit. And it was scary. And not every episode is as scary as the last, but it's I think it's it's part of why our generation is perhaps a little more um a little more morbid, perhaps, and a little more um nihilistic and a little more into spooky stuff and accepting of spooky stuff. Because we've we watched this this stuff growing up. We you know, it, it's it's sort of what makes... We were like young horror fans while watching it, even if it wasn't particularly horrifying. And I just think that that has really shaped an entire generation of people to what we enjoy. Like, a lot of what we enjoy. Like, the fact that there's a whole trope about white women listening to serial killer podcasts. I don't think that that very extremely accurate trope would have come about <laughs> we not all been raised on unsolved mysteries and i like we don't have to go into the psychology of why i think that we all do this sort of thing but it's the fact that we all did it we all watched unsolved mysteries and um the show has recently uh made a comeback this year and hopefully the week that this episode is released there will be a new season um that we won't have gotten to see yet but i will be actively consuming 
Um, so I thought it would be fun to sort of talk about it and go over like what made it such a wonderful thing for us to all watch and how we feel about the new show and the old show. Well, it's interesting that you, that you bring this up uh, as we get close to Halloween and, and how you talk about how it affects our, our preference for spooky stuff because, and maybe this is just because I watched the show on Lifetime, on Lifetime Television for Women, uh, that maybe they just, it was just because of the episodes they chose to show. But I remember the stories on Unsolved Mysteries while being unsettling also being very mundane. It was stuff like, you know, uh, murderer, you know, criminals who hadn't been caught or people who had disappeared without a trace the only, there's only a couple of episodes that i really remember where they talked about paranormal stuff there was one where they talked about uh like the men in black and some alien abduction stories and then there's another one uh where they talked about some uh some ghost legends some some ghosts some paranormal ghost sightings and around like you know prisons and and uh in and abandoned asylums so i don't remember unsolved mysteries having very many paranormal stories so it's interesting that that for something that was so formative and so terrifying, it's also in it in its own way very mundane. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just remembering it wrong, but uh, Kat, you, you seem to have more uh, more clear memories on this. Uh, no, than I, would, I, do. I would say that you're you're totally accurate um, because these were based off of things that people actually claimed happened or actually did happen, and I think that's part of what makes unsolved mysteries so interesting to people is because it's very accessible like on an emotional level because they're all more or less true stories so it's a lot of unsolved mysteries of like people who go missing and murders and stuff like that and there's a certain amount of if it's almost scarier i think because you're right like this is these are some mundane stories these are um things we would have read in the newspaper rather than on a national inquirer. So the, the lack of supernatural element to it makes it more accessible to the everyday person. And I think that's what made it so interesting and so scary was because you could watch something and, and go, shit, that guy's a serial killer and he's still out there. And that realness of it, I think is what made it so scary. Yeah, I agree. I, it, I think I think what made it so unsettling was was like you said, it's it's stuff that could conceivably happen to any of us. Um, Mike, what about you? What, uh, what 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 was your experience with unsolved mysteries growing up? So I'm pr I think I'm the oldest one here. Um, so I grew up with this in the late '80s, early '90s, and I remember watching this a lot on a local channel called CKNX. And there are several episodes that stick out to me uh, in particular. There's one episode where a woman had gained super strength to lift a car off of her son. And they just couldn't explain it. I think they called that. It was like unexplained phenomena or something. But there's one episode. I think it was in that one. I'm not sure. But it talked about angels. And a woman was telling how they thought she saw an angel but how Unsolved Mysteries did their dramatic reenactments. This angel was floating towards the screen, outstretched kind of like Superman would, but with their arms held as if they were going to embrace you in a hug. But the person had no eyeballs. So it was just these two black voids where eyes should be. And that terrified the shit out of me. Um, and that always kind of stuck with me. And then... I think this is where most of my interest in the paranormal started to come into. Cause I would always be very interested when they talk about ghost stories, they talk about um, ghost sightings, EVPs. They would also talk about aliens, alien abductions and whatnot and things that couldn't necessarily be explained. And then uh, earlier this year when COVID hit, I discovered that there was a YouTube channel that had uploaded every season with updates on this. So I think I powered through like two or three seasons of Unsolved Mysteries and it was several episodes where people had gone missing and they found out later it was a suicide, but it was all the weird connecting dots that led the investigators to figure that out, which kind of rekindled my love of this franchise. Plus I've always been a fan of Robert Stack because you remember him as the guy in the trench coat with the really smooth, silky voice. I remember that man as Ultra Magnus from Transformers 1986. Um, plus, he was just a badass actor, too. 
Um, but yeah, this show, I would definitely consider being a heavy influence on my life for looking outside the box, looking beyond what I could see, be willing to accept the fantastic is once you eliminate everything that's possible, what are you possibly left with, but the fantastic. So this expanded my mind into other areas and, uh, was willing to explore different options. Yeah, uh, on the subject of Robert Stack, can we uh, can we talk about like how he was absolutely perfect uh, as the host of that show? Like, I think ninety percent of the creep factor from that show just came from his voice and his narration. Well, yeah, like that's a guy who knew how to give the proper uh, kind of gravitas to whatever he was talking about, whether it was something more lighthearted. His inflections and his narrations could give you hope and optimism. If it was something more dangerous, if it was something more deadly, if it was a threat. He knew how to instill that fear in you. This man was a master of his craft. He was a great voice actor as well. And uh, one of one of my favorite things he ever did, and this will completely derail what I've just said, is when he did a cameo appearance in 1997's Basketball, where uh, they do the skit where Unsolved Mysteries tries to find... Um, uh, Trey Parker and he's like scenario number one he's hanging by his neck in a fucking closet and just hearing Robert Stack deliver that line <laughs> with the same enthusiasm that he would on the show killed me um, and that's how great an actor he was he could make something so serious sound so ridiculous um, but yeah like that 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 guy was a charm and when we lost him in the early 2000s, I think is when he passed away. Because I don't think the guy who went on to host after him, Dennis Farina, he, it's not that he was bad, because Farina was a cop in real life at one point. Um, but he wasn't Robert Stack. Okay, Kat. It, it's crazy because I literally don't remember anyone else. And I, I've, like, I've, like, read up on wikipedia and there were other hosts and i i can't i couldn't i couldn't tell you what one looked like what another host sounded like all i remember is robert stack like that's it that's the the the, the voice and face of unsolved mysteries and um, when we get into the the new series we could talk about how weird it is not to have him voicing in it um because he was just so spectacular um one of my favorite things to do would be to um, just in the last like couple of years, because uh, Unsolved Mysteries is all on, I believe, uh, Amazon Prime. Um, I would when I when I was sick, I would actually just like curl up on the couch and put on Unsolved Mysteries and I'd fall asleep in one episode and wake up in another. And I'd remember like, oh, I remember this episode from like a million years ago. Um, and I'd recognize these episodes, but it was always like, I knew what was going on because Robert Stack was there telling me what was happening. And it was like very soothing, even though the, the content is not necessarily the nicest of content. Yeah. Um, and it's, 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 I totally lost my train of thought. Someone else pick it up. I totally got what I was going to say say one of the things that i think this did is it showed a different side of what was happening in america and around the world it kind of gave face and gave importance to some of these crimes and disappearances that may not necessarily have been solved it also highlighted uh crimes that you never knew happened there's one episode i remember where a guy ripped off a shit ton of platinum because he worked at like some kind of a plant that manufactured things, but he was the, the night watchman. So what he did is he disabled the security system and he backed up his truck and stole like a ton of platinum. And if you know how precious a metal that is, that's millions of dollars for something. I think they were using this in like computer chips or something having to do with automotive manufacturing. It was something really, really strange, but he stole all this stuff. And there were like other strange episodes like, hey, this rape happened. And um, this guy was doing all this in this particular place. If you have any information and people would call in and these crimes would get solved because it would jog someone's memory or like 
I think this show paved the way for shows like America's Most Wanted being taken seriously because crimes were being solved. And while, you know, um, the guy from America's Most Wanted certainly had his own charisma and charm, he was dealing with more serious crimes, whereas Unsolved Mysteries was willing to explore different things. And I think it, it was interesting to see that this era of television would also spawn other things like, say, Rescue 911 with William Shatner and other true life stories and stuff like that. But Unsolved Mysteries yeah. was the real pioneer, I think. Huh. Un uh, yeah, Unsolved Mysteries did, in fact, come out before America's Most Wanted. Huh. I learned something today. Because as, as you're saying that, I'm like, wait, a minute, I thought I thought America's Most Wanted came first, but no, America's Most Wanted premiered 1988, uh, Unsolved Mysteries 1987. So yeah, okay, hmm, I learned something. Anyway, well, uh, Kat, you mentioned that actually that Unsolved Mysteries is is back on Amazon Prime. Now is this a whole new series or is this the old series repackaged with updates? Okay, the new series is actually on Netflix, um, whereas the old series, they have it all of it uploaded onto Amazon Prime. It might be on Netflix as well. I haven't watched Netflix in a long time. Um, so the the new series, I think it came out earlier this year, and I just uh, ignored it for a little while um, because I don't watch that much TV lately. Um, but uh, it came out earlier this year. Um, it's a limited series i think there was six episodes yes um and the the new season of it should be coming out the week that this episode airs um I, mike and i have very differing opinions on it but um i'd say the so first off the main difference the big difference is that there is no robert stack there is no narration actually at all and i was really? trying to figure out if this was like as a tribute that like okay so nobody can do it better than it's already been done so we're not going to have a narrator at all or um if it's just like a, a conscious choice that they made just to like we don't need one we can let the story tell itself so just um, just, just to make sure that I'm, I'm i'm following on the same page here so it there's no narration it's just the dramatic reenactment it's well, not a dramatic reenactment. It's interviews. And then the, the the stuff that would typically have been like, okay, this happened on this night, is somebody telling that as part of their interview. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, this series takes more of a news style documentary and... It's not bad. I found some cases more interesting than others. Like, I don't think the pilot is that interesting because I'm almost positive that they covered this on the re uh, on the first reboot of Unsolved Mysteries, where they talk about the woman hairdresser who went missing in the space of like 13 minutes, and then her body was found not very far from her like hair salon. And then the prime suspect is her husband, but another guy confessed to the murder. So they're really unsure. And it's just, it's really messed up. <clears throat> um, I think, I think having this approach, it's, it's good because they do make nods to the original series. It's like there are some musical hits in the theme song and in the intro that show a Robert Stack like figure in the trench coat and just the way that it's shot, it works, but obviously it's not Stack because he's passed away. Having no narrator, I think makes you take these cases a little bit, a little bit more seriously because these crimes are still active. Like the only one that felt out of place this season was the one that dealt with the unexplained phenomena in the middle of, of like Missouri in the 1960s. Um, and there wasn't a lot of physical evidence. There was a lot of interviews where they said, hey, this happened, this happened, this happened. But in radio in those days, you didn't save the news tapes to the archives. You would just re you'd maybe save that newscast for maybe a day, maybe two, and you'd rewrite over that tape because tape's a precious commodity. It wasn't all um, digital. It was all on analog magnetic tape. Um, and one episode, I found it to be the most interesting, but it was the one that was the hardest to follow. And that's the one involving the French murders that yes. took place. That one was really good. And I started doing some digging on Reddit about it. And supposedly this guy, this Xavier, this 
Count Xavier something DuPont or whatever the fuck his DuPont name is. Diligenes. Supposedly he's been sighted in Chicago and fairly recently. Um, I and, read that same Reddit. <laughs> I yeah, read the same Reddit stuff. And I'm like, that's fascinating because now that Netflix is seen by millions of people around the world with the invention of Reddit, smartphone cameras, Twitter, these people are not going to stay hidden for long. And this guy, he's he, when he left from the murders, he was broke. He's a smart guy, but he's broke. He's on the run. And they theorize in the episode that he probably took a cargo ship to either Argentina, the Americas, or somewhere in Latin America. But if if he's in America, he better be in, like, backwoods Arkansas because somebody will find him. Because there's too many, there's too many cameras, there's too many people to not find this guy. And I think this, I, I think that case has one of the strongest possibilities of being solved from this season um, of any of them. One that struck me as well as it was really tragic, but I don't think you'll ever solve it is the disappearance of the woman and the husband who killed another guy. And then the daughter just who, who basically yeah. confessed to the crimes told the prosecutors hey here's everything that happened here's where the body is her evidence then got thrown out for some reason because she changed it because of her lawyer somehow magic that shit up and she just disappears and she's got a kid and the kid is now living with an, another family member and that's another case that body will never be found yeah so that was like the the mom of like seven girls has just been like bouncing around from man to man and absolutely 100% murdered her husband or one of her many husbands um and the daughter like witnessed it and reported it to the police and then um retracted it uh because her mother basically forced her to lawyer up and forced her to retract it and then the daughter ends up going missing after sometime after her son is born and now that psycho bitch mom who has this kid like gets a hold of of that that her daughter's son and has basically like run off and it's they they can't like prosecute this woman because the only bit of evidence is is um has been retracted and like i did some digging up on that one too and it's like the family is like trying to raise money to get like a better lawsuit going and i'm sure with the traction from this show that they will be able to get some more money and get more traction to make that happen but it's like there's there's no body so i mean all of these stories were really messed up um the the one that really messed me up the most was um the fourth episode about a young man named alonzo brooks who goes missing after a party and the reason why this one messed me up as much as it did is because these other stories are like, here's an adult and something bad happened to him. Here's an adult, something bad happened to her. Here's some UFOs. This one was like a young guy. He was like in his very, very early 20s and he just goes to a party and isn't seen again after that. And this is taking place in like backwoods, very, very rural Kansas. So this is the same kind of, like, I know a lot of people from places like this. This is, like, very close to, like, the environment where I currently live. I live in the burbs of St. Louis, but, like, you drive 30 minutes in any one direction and you're going to run into these kinds of communities. So he's the only black kid at a, at a very all-white, like, rural party, and he goes missing afterwards. And it is almost certain that something happened at the party. And what breaks my heart about this one compared to the others is that he was just a kid. He was like in his extremely early 20s. He was like 22 or something. Mm -hmm. And so was everyone else. And I can wrap my head around like an adult sociopath who who does this or that. Or an adult who gets wrapped up in something and is killed. But I can't like make my head understand is a bunch of young people and like they just gang up and kill this kid and then like wait and dispose of the body later like it it's heartbreaking that they're young people who haven't fully formed their own lives and personalities and and and, and all of that and they're still becoming who they are and then they murder someone 
and and again we don't know exactly what happened in here that's why it's an unsolved mystery but certainly something happened at that party and that kid was killed and it it's just so horrible to think that like here's some kids just out having a good time and they kill someone and then they're never ever punished for it because they did it in such a way and people cared so little like the the cops didn't really care that much until enough time had passed that it would it became irrelevant to even try and look anymore like it's just heartbreaking that people that young have murder in them i think that's what messed me up about that one so much yeah that one was clearly some kind of a hate crime um and a lot of the forensic evidence just doesn't match up like in the episode they wonder if he was stored in a freezer or something because some things don't add up like some of the physical items they found on his body like like well if he was in that creek for a month why isn't the cash in his pocket destroyed why is his bandana in such good condition why was his mm -hmm. hat and his shoes found miles away from the scene something doesn't make sense and somebody out there clearly knows something somebody is walking around in that town they're passing by a murderer every single day and they are willing to live with it and i think if just hearing cat talk about this has kind of changed my opinion on this show a little bit more towards liking it more so than i did initially is the, that that episode in particular, you really feel the weight of the victims and what they've had to go through to find answers to what happened to Alonzo Brooks. And unfortunately, in those closeted rural communities, especially in the middle of America, where I know racism is still very remarkably present, you probably will never find the answers because if somebody decides to go to the cops and snitch, guarantee you they'll be dead in a week or they'll have to go on the run for the rest of their lives because somebody will seek retribution because you snitched. And I feel like I need to tell a joke to lighten things up because things have just gotten like really fucking heavy in the last Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think what made it <laughs> such a, to me, such a good season was each one of these minus the the ufo episode which we can talk about shortly but like all of these were very very dark and i think this season because it was more documentary than narration they spent a lot more time with the like the friends and the family of the victims and like i like cried in at least one of them because it was just so hard to like if you have any ounce of empathy in you to see these people who are suffering because they will never ever get closure unless someone comes forward and i just thought that it was just so much um it hit me a lot harder than the old show i think partially because there's no narration and all you're getting are like intense interviews with people um and then just just the way that everything was done i thought was I thought it was quite tastefully done because there's reenactments in it, but I thought that the reenactments were a lot less um, like dramatized than in the old show. I felt like it wasn't quite so uh, cheesy. And part of it is because that show came out in like the 80s and the 90s and everything. So to look back now at the old show, you're like, oh my God, this is so dated. And now this is almost all of it is newer cases. So you're like, shit this murderer is still out there um and this is relatively new stuff and there's there's more ways nowadays to record to take pictures um there's all kinds of security footage there's more ways to find people who have gone missing or have been murdered it should be harder now than it, it has ever been in the past to get away with murder and it's really fascinating to see what are the circumstances that that we haven't found this killer yet you know people have to be clever more clever than they've ever been because there's always somebody watching there's always somebody filming um and i think these cases really bring out how difficult it is even if you know what happened to to prove it even if you have the best idea you possibly could there's just ways the there's circumstances every single crime is its own unique thing there's no two crimes that are similar 
in these the cases that they presented. So, like, you can't learn something from one and then apply it to the next. Everything is so unique and individual. Um, and I thought that's what was so interesting about it, was that even with all of the modern technology now, here's people still getting away with murder. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, like, one of the things I really did like about this season is they talked with a lot of investigators they talked with like journalists they talked with people who have the power and the authority to get information that the public doesn't and i think that's something that the original series did i mean like you, you'd hear them talk to sheriffs deputies and district attorneys but you didn't hear them talk to as many journalists i think in the original run but some of these cases I have my severe doubts that they will ever be solved. And that is a real crime that bodies are left unburied and they're sorry, that are left buried and unclaimed and forgotten about. Um, like I said, especially with that woman who knew about these murders and could put away two terrible people or the guy who killed his family and buried them under his own house. Like there is some dark fucking people out there. So um, I'm kind of with Gonzo. We should lighten the mood a touch here. Yeah. Oh my God. This guy. We can talk about the UFO episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't well, that um, good. It, was. it really was it. Um, the, the UFO episode, I, I think one of the, the charming rose colored glasses things about watching old episodes of Unsolved Mysteries is that there's always these episodes where you're like, okay, now they're talking about aliens. Um, or something like that. Something that you're like, this is this is a bit silly even for this show. Well, and they, um, I'm sorry, Kat, keep going. <laughs> so I thought it was like appropriate in spirit that they included an episode where people are talking about UFO abductions. And like, it's a compelling argument. It is a compelling argument that they made. Um, like all episodes of Unsolved Mysteries are. Um, but it it's it feels so cheesy to talk about it and you know like good on them for sticking to their guns and and keeping that that trend that the old show set of sometimes you've got to talk about ufos because it is in fact an unsolved mystery one of the things I, i'm surprised given the advances in filmmaking in audio and video technologies i wouldn't have done ufos i would have focused on ghosts because there is some amazing, compelling footage. Like, there's a channel I watch on YouTube, for example, and it's called Nukes Top 5. And this guy gets sent all this footage from, like, everywhere. And some of it, I literally cannot explain with a professional background in it. I mean, maybe if these people had access to $100 million special effects, yeah, sure, maybe. Um, but with Unsolved Mysteries, like I said, focusing on a UFO, I guess they did it to sort of play the greatest hits but i would have done something that gonzo talked about in our last episode where he talked about uh eastern state uh, uh penitentiary you should talk to some of the old guards and some of the old ghost investigator teams that have gone through there because i've heard some evps come out of eastern state that will chill your very soul they are so clear. They are so well-defined. Could they be faked? Yeah, sure, maybe. But what if the off chance that they're not? Send them down to Leonard Turn and have, have them try and hunt down Maul Dyer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we're kind of running short on time, so uh, let's kind of start wrapping things up. So uh, yeah, Kat, uh, final thoughts regarding Unsolved Mysteries. Um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good um, ode to the the old series. I thought it's a little more, it takes things a little more seriously than the old series. Um, I just looked up on um, the Unsolved Mysteries Wikipedia and the new season will have a ghost episode. So if you want some ghosties, there will be Japanese ghosts. Um, oh, it's the tsunami ghost. That's uh -huh. right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. What, so one of the things real quick before we totally close this out, one of the things that I thought was really brilliant about this season that I thought was incredibly bold was that there was an episode where everything was in French um, because it was a, a murder that the, the, the count who killed his whole family in France. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to do another episode because here's you've got these ghosts in Japan. That's going to be next season. That's probably going to be a whole episode in Japanese. 
And you can't sleep on that shit. You can't fall asleep to that shit. You have to be glued to your TV to keep an eye on those subtitles. Um, and I thought that that was really, really engaging. Um, and just an interesting, I thought that was like a good leap for people to take for the, for the, for Netflix to take. So I'm really looking forward to the next season, which will come out and I will have no time to watch it in the next like two weeks, but I'm really excited for the next season. Um, I like that the seasons are short, that the episodes aren't horrendously long. Um, it feels like the right amount of time. Um, I really hope that in the future, um, we start to see uh, updates. I would really love it if there's updates. Yeah. All right. Totally. Um, for my thoughts on this, hearing Kat and I have this kind of back and forth on the series, I've kind of changed my mind from my initial thought 30 minutes ago. I do like this series. I think some episodes are stronger than others. The French episode was a bold move, especially in this era of people with short attention spans and smartphones. So I'm hoping that they do do something exciting with the ghost episode, especially because it deals with such a large scale natural disaster. And I have thought about the possibility of what about all those people who died in like the Indian Ocean tsunami? And then obviously the tsunami that happened in Japan in 2011, I think it was. Um, I've always thought about that. And now I'm going to get some answers to that potentially so the series is definitely worth checking out the, the new season comes out on october 19th so you can check that out hopefully it's good i am looking forward to it and hopefully there will be more updates and the series will continue its high production values and maintain its uh, journalistic integrity while telling a compelling story my final thoughts are you two have depressed the hell out of me so after we finish here i'm gonna go watch deadpool 2 and cheer cheer myself up <laughs> And with that, that is all the time that we have for Nerd to the Third Power this week. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. We will see you guys next time. As always, I'm Dr. Gonzo. I'm the cat. And I'm Mike Dodd. We'll see you guys next time. Taka, play us out. <laughs>